More than 80 bodies have been pulled from the waters in Manchester since 2004. Nearly all of them have been young men. Is this simply a coincidence or is there more to it? After researching some of these cases, I've come across some strange findings. Almost all of the cases I have looked at include the victim exhibiting strange behaviour before their disappearance, which you'll see as we progress through the cases. All of the victims had been drinking earlier during the night and all of them had either become separated from their friends or had left to go home. In addition to that, and I find this absolutely fascinating, despite the density of CCTV coverage found here in the UK, the victim is never seen entering the water and they are often missing for weeks or months before being found despite extensive searches. In fact, the coroner consistently states something to the effect of, despite an extensive investigation, we have no idea how, when, or where the victim entered the water. However, the coroner does generally offer some sort of basic conclusion, such as accidental drowning, but 28 of these cases returned an open verdict, meaning that the coroner had no idea what the cause of death was, nor the circumstances. Birmingham has a much more extensive network of canals than Manchester does, and despite having a higher population, the fatality rate in Manchester is double that of Birmingham's. Across the UK, less than 30% of accidental drownings involve people with traces of alcohol in their blood, except this seems to be a common feature in Manchester. David Plunkett was studying event management at Leeds University and worked voluntarily in various roles from box office to bar work to expand his experience. According to locals, David was well known and well liked and they could not believe the circumstances surrounding his death. On the 17th of April 2004, David and one of his friends went out on a mystery tour night around Manchester. At some point they had gotten separated and David was last seen leaving the Budweiser Music Festival at the Daytona Racetrack in Trafford Park, Greater Manchester. At 1.20am on the 18th, David's parents received a phone call from his friend who said that he and David had lost one another. David's mother reassured his worried friend and began to call David on his mobile phone. The Manchester Evening News.co.uk reported. Mrs Plunkett said, we rang David, and when David answered, he was incoherent, there was no noise in the background, and it struck me that he was on his own. Ten minutes into the phone call, he started screaming. He was howling and yelling, it was horrendous. She handed the phone to her husband Mike and dialed the emergency services, but little could be done because they did not know where he was. They managed to keep the phone line open until 4.30am, but there was no further contact. Records of the phone call showed that when he answered the call from his parents, he was located somewhere between Salford Keys and the Old Trafford football ground. These locations are separated by the River Irwell, but a bridge on Trafford Road allows passage. David's parents stated that their son sounded spaced out and not really with it when they last spoke to him. David's father described the scream as being an unearthly howl and that he had never heard anything like it before. What was interesting about this was that there was no background noise and nothing to suggest that David was being attacked. David's mother said the scream was so sudden and came out of nowhere. It was as if someone had startled him. It came right out of the blue. That's what scared me so much. I had never heard him scream and he had never sworn in front of me before. David's body was found two weeks later on April the 30th in the Manchester Ship Canal. ExaminerLive.co.uk reported, Home Office pathologist Dr John Rutherford said that there was absolutely no evidence that David had been assaulted and that the most likely cause of death was drowning. David's mobile phone was later found by his uncle upstream from the body, despite an extensive search by the police. The investigation concluded that the cause of death was accidental drowning, but David's parents suspect otherwise. His father said something had terrified him. He was on the phone, but our son could not speak to us, and that's not because he was drunk. His mother added, the screaming and howling was so unearthly, we just thought that it had to be something. 
Former detective Tony Blockley also found the circumstances bizarre, adding that he questioned whether David had been chased or lured, stating that David's parents would have heard the splash from the mobile phone if he had fallen into the water. Except they didn't. As said, they didn't hear anything at all. No cars, no one else talking or shouting, no one running, just eerie silence followed by David's unearthly howl. In 2015, newspapers began circulating the suspicion that a serial killer was the cause of these canal deaths after Professor Craig Jackson, head of psychology at Birmingham City University said that he was led to believe the deaths had all occurred in the city centre rather than the whole Greater Manchester County. He continued, The deaths all had the hallmarks of foul play. It's unlikely that such a high number of cases are the result of just accidents or suicides as canals are not popular suicide spots, especially for men. Detective Superintendent Peter Marsh rebuked the comments saying that there was absolutely no evidence to support the claims a serial killer was involved in the deaths. So what on earth is happening to these young men? David's death and the cause of his distress remain a mystery. On the 17th of December 2010, Nathan Tomlinson and his friends went out around the town for a Christmas party and he was last seen outside, leaving the Mitra bar in heavy snow by himself. Nathan failed to return home that night and failed to return home the following day. In the early hours of the 19th, Nathan was reported missing by his mother. Unfortunately, the police did not seem to take this very seriously as she was told by a police officer. He's probably snuggled up to a nice young woman. According to the family, Nathan's disappearance was completely out of character. Nathan was a trainee sports science teacher who loved his job and seemed to have a bright future ahead of him. After leaving the bar, Nathan was captured numerous times walking through Manchester on CCTV. He approached a bus driver seeking directions and it appeared that he attempted to use Google Maps on his mobile phone. Authorities believe that he was simply trying to find his way back home to Brinnington, Stockport, but had gotten lost while doing so. The bus driver had told Nathan to go to Piccadilly Station to get a train home, however, Nathan would never make it to the train station. The Daily Mail reported, CCTV showed Nathan leaving the pub and jumping over a wall near the cathedral before walking across a snowbound Victoria Street. Police believe he then walked along a new footpath next to the River Irwell and into central Salford. He is then captured walking on Key Street and Chapel Street where he briefly boards the bus to ask for directions. A last CCTV sighting shows him running through the snow across the Adelphi footbridge near Linen Court off Silk Street. He turns left after crossing the bridge and goes out of camera view. Since then, there has been no sighting of him. It has never been established why Nathan was running. The CCTV cameras never picked up anyone else near him, so what exactly caused him to run? Another completely bizarre finding was that the route Nathan took to his last known location was not direct but was in fact very circuitous and somehow he managed to complete this two and a half mile journey in 22 minutes. Former detective Tony Blockley also examined this case and found that it took him 44 minutes to travel the same route. How did Nathan manage to complete this journey so quickly in comparison, he did not run the entire distance as per the CCTV footage? Did he use other unseen methods of travel? That seems unlikely given that he wanted to reach the train station. Perhaps it wasn't Nathan shown on the CCTV, though the police were confident that it was. It's unclear exactly what happened here, but Nathan's body was located 8 weeks after he disappeared, despite 15 extensive police searches including divers who had already searched the area he would later be found. Nathan's body was discovered by a passerby in the River Irwell near the Adelphi Bridge. The police said that there were no signs of foul play and pathologist Naomi Carter said that Nathan had probably drowned but it was uncertain how he ended up in the river or if he had died beforehand. When found, Nathan was missing his coat, passport, phone and wallet. He had earlier sent a text message to his family saying that he was pacing himself and was drinking shandy. Nathan's mother disagreed with the police and stated that she always thought Nathan's death was suspicious. 
I think the key to understanding Nathan's death may lie in answering why he was running. Like David Plunkett, was Nathan scared of something? Did he think he was being chased? As mentioned, no one could be seen near him or chasing him, so why was he running? I think that may have been a clue that was not emphasised enough during the investigation. As Naomi mentioned, it was not understood how he ended up in the water in the first place, nor has it ever been explained why he was missing his items. This was an unusual disappearance that left a lot of unanswered questions. On the 29th of June, 2012, Chris Brainy, accompanied by a large group of friends, travelled to a Stone Roses reunion concert located in Heaton Park, Manchester. Chris was with his friend Mark throughout the duration of the concert, where Chris realised that he had lost his phone at around 11.30pm before the gig ended. After the concert had finished, the two friends tried to leave together, but became separated at some point in the chaotic crowd. Chris did not return home that night or the following day. When he still did not answer the phone two days later, he was reported missing which sparked a massive manhunt across the region. CCTV footage showed Chris retrieving shoes he had bought earlier and hidden at Shoot Hill Metrolink station. Mark explained that the pair had bought plimsolls as they were wearing wellingtons at the gig and thought that they would not be allowed into bars afterwards wearing wellingtons if they chose to go around the town. Chris was also thought to have been seen at the park and ride site which was set up for the concert. It's thought that he was also seen getting off a bus at the site where he spoke to a group of young women, telling them that he had lost his phone and friends. Later, Chris made his way through the city centre and onto St Mary's Parsonage, where he travelled down a remote alley and onto a riverside walkway. It's unclear exactly what happened down that alley or afterwards, but Chris's body was found 10 days later in the Manchester Ship Canal. The Messenger newspapers.co.uk reported, At the inquest, which was held at Stockport Coroner's Court on February the 4th, Deputy Coroner Joanne Kersley said that she did not have the evidence available to her to determine exactly how Christopher came to be in the water. She added that while the traces of alcohol and MDMA, a form of ecstasy in Christopher's system, contributed to his death, as they may have altered his perception and mood, they did not cause it. Pathologist Naomi Carter explained that the riverside walkway at the end of the alley Chris travelled down is lined with a very high rail and said Christopher must have climbed over it or been thrown over it into the river 40 feet below. However, Detective Inspector Deborah Oakes went on to rule out any third-party involvement stating that there is only one way in and out of that alleyway, and no one did so for many hours before or after Christopher. Naomi added that Chris had sustained some cuts to his face, but concluded that they happened after he entered the water as they were not coupled with bruising, which is common with injuries sustained after death. One witness whose flat backs onto the walkway stated that during the time of the investigation he had seen a man matching Christopher's description sitting in the alley with his back to the railing during the early hours of the 30th. The question arose as to whether Chris had committed suicide that night, but it was quickly disputed by his father who said that the idea that Christopher had intentionally harmed himself had not entered his consciousness for even a second. This is another case that simply does not make sense. His parents were told that they will never know how their son died, with the deputy coroner Joanne Kersley adding that she simply couldn't say how Chris had ended up in the water. If Chris had been assaulted during his time spent in the alleyway, then bruising would have been expected, and no screams or yells were ever heard, making this scenario further unlikely. It's thought that Chris was happy and no evidence of depression existed, so what exactly took place down that alley, it's unlikely that we'll ever know. Suvik Paul was a student studying at the Manchester University and went missing while on a night out with some of his friends. It was reported that in the hours leading up to his disappearance, he had consumed alcohol and had taken ecstasy. Suvik and his friends that night had visited the Warehouse Project nightclub located in Trafford. At 10pm during their time in the establishment, Suvik became separated from his friends and then behaved in a belligerent manner as he charged at a member of the security staff in an attempt to jump the queue to the toilet. 
Suvik was thrown out of the nightclub at 10.55pm and was last seen on CCTV outside the building at 11pm that night, which would also be the last time Suvik was seen alive. Unfortunately, Suvik did make an attempt to text his friends that he'd been kicked out, but because the phone lines were so busy, they only got through the following day. He was reported missing the following morning by his roommate, and despite an extensive search effort, no sign of him could be located. 22 days later, Suvik's body was found in the Bridgewater Canal just 50 feet from the nightclub. ManchesterEveningNews.co.uk reported, Pathologist Naomi Carter concluded that the cause of death was drowning and that there were no marks to Suvik's clothing and no physical injuries. Recording an open verdict, Coroner Joanne Kersley said that although the drugs were likely to have contributed to his behaviour, they were not the cause of death. She said, despite extensive investigation, it cannot be ascertained as to where or how he entered the water. Suvik's father said that he believed there must have been an involvement of a third party, though given that Suvik hadn't sustained any injuries, no evidence of this could be found. At some point during the night, CCTV caught Suvik trying to climb a six-foot fence which police believed was an attempt to get back into the club. However, former detective Tony Blockley made an astute observation. He detailed that the fence in question means that for some reason Suvik had crossed a bridge over a canal and then travelled down the far side to try and climb over the fence that was on the opposite side of the canal to the nightclub. This seems highly unusual and it appears that once more CCTV cameras have picked up the victim behaving strangely before their disappearance. Was Suvik planning to climb over the fence, jump into the canal and then swim back to the club where he would have been soaking wet, or was he making an attempt to get away from a perceived threat? The official cause of death was as a result of drowning, though again it is important to reiterate that the inquest heard that it was a mystery as to how and where he had gotten into the water. Over six years have passed now and the circumstances behind Suvik's death are unlikely to ever be answered. Charlie Pope's body was found in the Rockdale Canal on March the 2nd after he disappeared on a night out during the notorious Beast from the East storm. Charlie was in his first year of university studying economics with philosophy and like most people his age, he would drink socially and go on nights out around the town. On February the 28th, Charlie along with his flatmate Lewis drank some rum together from their halls known as Oak House located in Fallowfield. Afterwards, they made their way to the zombie shack in the town where they drank cocktails together. The pair of friends left the bar together later that night and tried to board a bus, but they were told by the driver that Charlie was too drunk to travel on his bus, so they then returned to the zombie shack. If only Charlie had been allowed to board that bus, the following may not have taken place. Not long after 2am, the pair had been separated for a while and Lewis thought that Charlie was with some of his other friends or had already left the establishment to go home. Charlie was never seen alive again. He failed to return home that night and Lewis discovered a missed Facebook call from Charlie at 6am. He made attempts to call Charlie but the calls went unanswered. It was at this point Charlie was reported as missing. Two days later, on March the 2nd, Charlie's body was found by Northwest Underwater Search and Marine Officers in the water near Rain Bar on Great Bridgewater Street. CCTV would once more discover something strange, however. Detective Inspector Gareth Davis stated that CCTV showed Charlie leaving the bar at roughly 1.20am before walking along Oxford Road in the direction of his home. This was followed by three missing hours whereby police don't know where he was or what he was doing. Strangely, CCTV picked him up once more at 4.43am heading along Oxford Road again in the direction of the city centre. It has never been established as to why he made the decision to turn around and walk back towards the city centre and away from the safety and warmth of his home. At this point, ChronicleLive.co.uk reported, he was then seen walking unsteadily in the snow down Whitworth Street and past the lock building along a two path and towards a lock gate before moving out of sight. A combination of Snapchat and a phone call place him as being alive at around 6am and sometime after that he fell into the canal. Although there is no CCTV to tell exactly where, when or how he fell into the water, Coronel Nigel Meadows said. 
Despite being one of the most CCTV heavy nations in the world, once again we have another canal death where authorities have no idea as to when or how Charlie managed to get into the water. Pathologist Dr. Al Haber stated that Charlie had died from drowning, exacerbated by cold shock, hypothermia and alcohol intoxication. This was followed by Nigel stating Charlie's death was accidental after he had consumed a not insignificant amount of alcohol. A couple of questions remain unanswered in this case. Firstly, despite being intoxicated, it's unlikely that Charlie was lost and he knew his way home given that he was spotted at 1.20am walking in the direction of his home. And I could find no reports of police suspecting that he was lost. So what exactly happened during his three hours of missing time? Did something take place that frightened Charlie which made him turn around and head back into the city centre? Perhaps he did simply get lost, but again I could find no mention of this and he had been in the city for some time. Secondly, and similarly to many other cases, how did Charlie get into the water in the first place and where, to this day police have no idea where, when or how he entered the water? This was another devastating case that has not been fully explained. What do you make of these disappearances? Are these young men simply falling into the water or is something else taking place here? Do let me know your thoughts. I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of you that have subscribed to the channel and who share these videos, like them and just generally show support. I appreciate it a lot and can't thank you enough. And I'd just like to say thank you to my patrons for supporting me over at Patreon, so thank you very much for all of your support and generosity. Anyway, do let me know what you thought of this one and you'll find all of the sources and links in the description below. As always, thank you very much for watching, I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, it helps me a lot. I hope that you have a great day or evening depending on where you are. Be safe guys and I'll catch you soon, peace.